Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Head Over Meals, Weight Management Strategies from Behavioral Medicine. I'm Greg Berry, Director of Communications in the Office of Alumni Affairs. Since we're virtual today, please excuse technical issues or glitches that may pop up. Have a video or audio issue? Click reconnect to get back to the webinar quickly. This webinar is being recorded. A replay will be uploaded on our website by tomorrow. Also, have a question for our guests? Toss it in the chat. We'll have time for Q&A at the end. Today, Dr. Megan Hayes makes a return to our webinar series. Dr. Hayes is an associate professor and rehabilitation psychologist in the UAB Hearsing School of Medicine. After, after earning her bachelor's degree in 2008 from the University of North Carolina, Dr. Hayes obtained her Master of Arts in 2013 and PhD in 2016, both in clinical psychology from the University of South Florida. Dr. Hayes has become a regular for us and we're excited about that. A year ago, she joined us for Beating the Burnout, Strategies for Finding Joy in Your Job and Life Again. Earlier this year, she came back for Sweet Dreams Are Made of These, Strategies for Improving Your Sleep. You can take a look at those and more um, in our complete library of webinars at alumni.uab.edu slash videos. At this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Hayes for today's presentation. Welcome back. We're so excited to hear about weight management. Awesome. Can you hear me okay? We sure can. Okay, great. So we'll start by sharing my screen real quick, make sure I get it right, and then we'll get going. So let's see. All right. Are you seeing the presentation version, Greg? You're all set. You bet. All right. Um, as I get rolling, you just let me know if anything isn't looking right, okay? All right. Well, um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so glad to be back on this webinar again. Um, as Greg mentioned, I've been here and spoken about burnout in the past and also spoke about sleep medicine, behavioral sleep medicine the last time. And I got to thinking that weight management might be another area that people would be interested in. Um, a lot of my expertise in this area comes from my experience in cardiac and pulmonary rehab. Um, one of the goals of many of the patients that I work with in those programs is to lose weight. They have um, kind of been given instructions by their physicians to lose weight. Um, however, we all know that that can be really difficult to do. So it's easy to tell someone to lose weight, but then it can be really challenging to know how to do that um, and how to actually put that into place. And honestly, the field is really confusing, right? It's uh, wrought with a lot of med you know, uh, messages that are rooted in diet culture and a lot of misinformation and a lot of unrealistic expectations. So my hope today is to share with you all what I know from the field of behavioral medicine, what I know of the evidence base, and to give you some strategies that you can actually put into place starting today to try to hopefully improve your weight management since I'm assuming that's something you are all working on if you're in the webinar today or maybe you're working with some clients or patients who are working in that area. So what we'll do is I'll first talk about defining and understanding what clinically meaningful weight loss even is, um, what are we aiming for, what would be a good amount, and why that weight loss might be important. What does that lead to? Does weight you know, equal health? What are some of the clarifications there? I also want to talk about the contributions of some various factors, including our behaviors and our thoughts, to how much we weigh, what's important, what's not as important, what might be some myths out there. So I'm hoping to clarify a few things for y'all today, but I really want the bulk of this presentation to be all strategies. We know people like strategies, they like tools. I know I do. So I want someone who knows the area to come and tell me what I could do, what I could do starting today, what's practical. And so I'll do my best to offer some practical tips for you all um, from my field of behavioral medicine and health psychology. And then finally, I do want to leave some time for questions and answers. As in the past with these webinars, I know we don't always have time for every question. You guys asked some really good questions um, and some of them have complex answers. So if I don't know something right on the spot, I'll just answer it in an email to Greg later and he can post that information and get back to you all, um, especially if we don't have time for some of them. So we'll first start with a little bit of prevalence and information. This map is the prevalence of obesity in the United States, which is currently defined as a body mass index of 30 or higher. There are a lot of problems with the BMI. I will put that out there. Many of you may have heard of those things. It's not the best or the most accurate measure when it comes to health. 
but it's just what really all the major organizations still use, including the CDC. So this map came from the CDC website. But as you can see, the prevalence of obesity is very high nationwide. Um, you know, here in Alabama, our rate is between about, you know, 35 to 40 percent in our area um, of individuals who, based on their height and weight, are considered obese. Um, but nationwide, the number hovers around about 42 percent of all adults. And we've seen a major increase in uh, individuals with obesity from about the last couple of decades. So it went from about a third of the country to being more of this 42 percent. Um, closer to 2020. And we know that obesity does, you know, the estimated annual medical cost is nearly $173 billion. At least that was in 2019. It's more now. Um, so it does lead to a lot of medical costs. And we know that the annual medical costs are a great deal higher, about $2,000 higher um, for those who are in an obese category as opposed to those of a healthy weight. And that's just, of course, an average. Um, so there are significant financial costs to obesity as well. And we also know that, you know, obesity is also a health disparity issue. So it does affect some groups more than others. And I think this is really important to point out. So we know that non-Hispanic Black adults tend to have the highest rates of obesity, and specifically African-American women um, do have even higher than 50 percent um, Hispanic adults as well. And then we have non-Hispanic white adults at 41 percent on average. And then non-Hispanic Asian adults with 16.1% um, being considered in the obese range. We also know that adults in the middle age from 40 to 59 tend to have higher rates than those in a younger age range, as well as the oldest age range. We know that um, obesity also tends to be related to educational attainment. So those who have college degrees tend to have the lowest rates of obesity. But it kind of gets complicated because this can vary based on the race and gender of a person. So, for example, in African-American women, it does appear that they have a higher proportion of individuals who are obese um, more than white women across all levels of educational attainment. So it's really complicated and it can be hard to simplify. And we also know incomes related, of course, as well. So. Um, that's all to say that this is a health disparity issue as well. And um, I always want to point that out because all bodies are not created equal and there are a lot of differences in people that can impact this. In terms of weight and health, so recently I feel like this is getting a lot more publicity that, you know, just because someone is overweight or obese does not mean that they have health issues. And that is completely true. However, it's hard to look at the data that we have for decades, right, and not conclude that body size, no matter how you measure it, has some correlation with health outcomes. And also everything we know biologically about metabolic health suggests there is a causal component, right? So it's really implausible to suggest that having a larger body size is not a risk factor for something like diabetes, for example. But I'll kind of get to the reverse of that. But obesity is associated with all of these things. Um, I kind of hit the highlights here, but diabetes, cardiovascular disease, certain cancers like liver disease, Alzheimer's, musculoskeletal disorders like chronic pain syndrome, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which has definitely been on the rise and has replaced alcoholic-related liver disease as the primary cause of liver cirrhosis. So that's something to really keep in mind. Um, chronic kidney disease as well. So there's a lot of medical issues that can happen associated with obesity. But this is a, a big but here. Presuming what someone's health is like based on their body size is not a good idea, right? There is immense error that can happen for this. And this can happen in both directions. So um, just because someone's in a higher BMI category doesn't mean that they're going to have any of these health issues. Um, their labs could look great. They could, their metabolic markers, cardiometabolic markers could look wonderful, their blood pressure, right? All of those things. So we never want to assume that a person in a larger body has health issues simply because they're in this category and vice versa, right? Someone with a quote unquote normal BMI could very easily have many of these health issues. So um, it is wrong and an error to assume based on someone's body size. And kind of along those lines, I wanted to really put it out there about weight stigma, right? Because 42% of U.S. adults say they face some form of weight stigma, right? Whether this be making fun of someone for their weight or 
perceiving comments from other people um, about their wage, kind of overhearing someone talking to them. And unfortunately, a lot of times the sources of this weight stigma are things like healthcare providers, people like their healthcare providers, even their spouses, people close to them. That's one of the really unfortunate things about weight stigma. But perhaps ironically, weight stigma actually leads to people cutting down on behaviors that would actually reduce their risk of issues related to being overweight and obese, right? So weight stigma actually can lead individuals to not want to go to the gym, for example, for fear of what other people might think or internalizing that weight stigma. And we actually see that the more weight stigma people report in larger bodies, that we see an increase in their weight over time, right? That's kind of ironic, but weight stigma can actually lead to an increase in weight. And why would that be? One of the theories is that, you know, being the person who is on the um, tail end of discrimination, right, due to weight or um, perceiving weight stigma, it actually has been linked to higher cortisol levels. And we know that cortisol, which is a stress hormone, has been linked to fatty deposits in the abdomen, for example, and multiple chronic health problems. Cortisol is definitely something we know is associated with weight gain. That's why when people are on chronic steroids, for example, prednisone, they often tend to gain weight that's associated with gain, uh, gaining weight over time because those steroids can increase cortisol levels in the body. So we also know that people who deal with weight stigma are at an increased risk for psych issues, right? So whether that be depression, anxiety, um, things that are also associated with weight gain. Um, and they tend to avoid seeking further, further medical treatment and they're um, this is really unfortunate because if an individual is experiencing bias in a healthcare setting, and what this might look like is, um, for example, a doctor, you know, perceiving that a doctor is insinuating that all of their problems are due to their weight and making assumptions about how they are behaving or acting, such as assuming that that patient is overeating or binge eating or that type of thing. When they perceive that weight stigma, they are more likely to doctor shop or delay getting treatment for various health issues. So it's just really important to point out that every bit of weight stigma that a person encounters from their doctor makes it a lot less likely that they're going to go back. And well, that's a really bad outcome um, because they will not get the treatments that could help and benefit them. And finally, we know that you know weight discrimination is also real at a systemic level. So for example, just individuals in larger bodies are less likely to be hired and promoted. And there's actually less protections legally in place for individuals who are overweight and obese than there are for some other um, you know, disadvantaged groups. So let's kind of, that's a little bit of background, just some things to keep in mind as we go along here. But what is meaningful weight loss and how do we define it? You know, the first thing I'll point out is this both goes for patients that I work with, as well as just kind of out there in the media, right? I think people often think about weight loss as being pretty dramatic, right? Weight loss that matters has to be a big weight loss and it has to be dramatic. And uh, people often will think about it as going from like an overweight or obese category of their body mass index on that chart that the doctor shows you to a normal weight. But this can often be like to go from an overweight or obese category to a normal weight on the BMI can be a lot of weight to lose, right? It can be very overwhelming to think of. And often it can be unrealistic because we know that the BMI is not very accurate. Um, you know, there can be some racial biases in the BMI. Um, it doesn't take into account how much muscle mass or lean muscle mass that someone has. It's literally just based on their height and weight. So there's some problems that can come from trying to think of weight loss in that way. But to tell you the truth, so as providers, you know, as someone who works in the cardiac rehab space, I'm thinking about weight loss as being successful and meaningful anywhere, sometimes even 3%, but anywhere from about like 5% of a person's body weight to 10% of a person's body weight. And the important thing is that that weight reduction is maintained over time. So let's say, for example, you are a 200 pound person, a 10% weight loss for you is going to be 20 pounds. And that's still a significant amount of weight. So a 5% might even sound a little easier as an initial goal, or a little more attainable of a 10 pound weight loss, right? And you can even work on some mini goals leading up to that. But um, 
the reason why we are concerned about excess weight in the first place is because of this relationship that it has that I showed to you all earlier to cardiovascular and metabolic risk, right? So all of those things that being in the obese category and sometimes even overweight, depending on the person, um, we know the relationship to that risk. So we want to avoid that. And we know that weight reductions that are seemingly small, three, five, ten percent, are associated with a host of benefits physiologically and in our risk profiles. So just a few of the things we've seen in the literature. So one is a reduction in blood pressure, a reduction in A1C, right? If you're a person who is watching your A1C, um, we all want to be watching our A1C, but even small reductions like three, five, ten percent of body weight. This could again be like losing five or ten pounds, depending on your body weight, can lead to a reduction in these things. Exercise capacity, our ability to exercise, the less body mass we have, the easier it does tend to be to exercise. It, we can improve our capacity. Um, triglycerides tend to go down, our total cholesterol tends to go down. We tend to see better good cholesterol or HDL as it's called. We tend to see a reduction in LDL and a better HDL and LDL ratio. So these are all again from seemingly small weight loss, right? Um, but we also know that when we tie our weight loss goals to meaningful outcomes like our health, that we tend to be more successful. So I encourage everyone to think beyond the superficial and it's always nice to look better, but let's also think about our cardio, um, vascular and metabolic risk profiles and what could be improved. And before I get to some of the strategies, because again, I didn't want to spend that much time on the background, but I just want to point out this graphic to show that there are so many factors that can influence body weight. And as I get into the strategies, you're going to hear some more, but keep in mind that how much you eat, right, or your behaviors are one piece of the equation, but there's a lot going on genetically, physiolog physiologically, what does your lifestyle look like? How active are you? What medications you're on? I mentioned prednisone earlier. Um, there's other medications associated with weight gain. Um, what is your dieting history? Do you have a history of yo-yoing? Do you have certain medical conditions like glandular conditions that could increase your weight? And psychology, of course, too. So for me today, you're going to hear a little bit about multiple domains that you see here in these circles. But all of these things, and there's probably some that I forgot, are contributing to how much we weigh ultimately. So it is so much more than just a willpower issue. It's very complicated. And as you heard before, it's also a health disparity issue involved as well, right? It can be a class issue. Um, it can be an issue based on race, ethnicity, and other factors. So um, it's complicated is the long story on that one. So let's get into some of the evidence base for what does help us to manage our weight. Um, and these are kind of the top tips that I try to condense for you all. The first one is simply to set better goals. So we talked earlier, like people often think that they have to lose a ton of weight to successful to be successful. And we all kind of know what to do in a sense. We probably need to eat less, right? Eat fewer calories and maybe move some more. But how to do that can really be the challenge. And you probably heard of SMART goals, and this is a great framework for goal setting and to set goals that we're more likely to achieve. So I really encourage you to think about how you can move a goal like, I want to just get healthy, or I want to lose weight which tend to be too general, right? Um, hey, maybe I could lose three pounds by the end of this year and I've met my goal, right? That's fine if that's my specific goal or maybe just lose one pound, right? But lose weight, you probably need to get a little more granular with that or what does get healthy mean, right? Does that mean that I wanna reduce my A1C by a point over the next year? What does that look like? And remember specifically when we're setting goals about body weight that we're thinking relatively small. I want you to be thinking three, five, ten percent of body weight. It is not fair to yourself, and it's only going to lead to some problematic behaviors if you set a goal to lose 20 pounds in the next month. Sure, it might be possible depending on a number of factors, but is that sustainable or are you going to do that in a healthy way? So really considering the number that you choose for a weight loss goal is important. 
we talked about tying that to other health outcomes. So instead of, I really want to fit into a size blank, which that's fine. That could be an aesthetic side goal, but I really encourage you to tie your weight loss goals to health outcomes. We know from research that that tends to make us more successful. So what do you want to see change? What do your current lab bills values look like? What was your blood pressure at your last PCP visit? What do you want to see change? Um, and really tie your focus on the health outcomes, honestly, over the weight. Um, so for example, you might, you know, uh, some of my patients in the past have said something to me like, well, I think I would lose weight if I pack my lunch more often. That's a great idea, right? And that's kind of a great overarching theme that we can work with. But to make that a SMART goal, I might work with that patient to come up with a more specific and targeted SMART goal, such as I will bring my lunch three times a week, each week in November. And I might make that even more clear with them by how we're going to achieve that. So here's some other you know, goals I'm going to do it the night before. I'm going to put a calendar reminder the night before those three days so that I make sure that I get it done. I'm going to ask my spouse to hold me accountable. So we can put a lot of other things in place to make these SMART goals more successful. So the take home of this is don't make your goals too broad. The more specific your goals are and based on a smart work framework, the more likely you are to be successful and focus not just on the number of the scale, but also tie your um, goals, your weight goals to health outcomes. So my second tip for you all is to engage in self monitoring. We know from years of research that self monitoring of our own behaviors is the hallmark of successful behavioral therapy for weight loss. So we can do things like monitoring our diet, for example, the calories that we're consuming. You can monitor your exercise, so how many minutes and when you exercise, um, estimated calorie you know, that were born, uh, burned. You can monitor your weight as well. So these are all certain factors um, that have been associated with self-monitoring and weight loss. So why does self-monitoring work? So one of the things that it does is it increases our awareness. So it slows down kind of that decision-making process as well. So, um, you know, for example, let's say, and I put a few apps up there and I'll, I'll go over some of these at the end as well, if you're interested in learning a few that um, I have personally vetted. But we know that if you're using an app, for example, that you have to enter something in there, right? So um, as you're starting to think like, okay, well, I usually eat this whole sleeve of Oreos, but I know from when I logged it yesterday that that is quite a bit of calories. And if I eat all that again, I'm gonna have to log it again. That can help to increase our awareness of the content of the food that we're consuming calorically or added sugars or carbohydrates or whatever we might be monitoring. Um, but it also does make us think again, if you will. So it does slow down that impulsive eating um, or kind of those habits that we might be stuck and kind of bring that to our awareness. It can also help to prevent weight gain. So if you're in more of a maintenance phase, every so often going back and tracking these um, things like your weight, your nutrition, or your exercise can help to prevent gaining weight once you've lost it. Um, and the other thing that I'll say about this is it doesn't have to be an app. It could be a journal. So I put like just a basic food journal there. Do what works for you and you don't have to use any particular app. The best way of journaling the, your and self-monitoring your behaviors is the way that's going to you're actually going to do, right? Um, so what works for you may not work for another person. And that's just something to keep in mind. And the other thing I would point out is really, if this is getting obsessive for you and we're kind of entering into more of a disordered type of territory where all you're thinking about is tracking, I would definitely stop tracking at that point and consult a nutritionist so um, or a psychologist. So you want to be really careful with when these behaviors, just like anything we're monitoring, can go overboard. It's meant to be a tool, not something for you to shame yourself or to cause you anxiety. It's just meant to be data and to help increase your awareness. My third tip is not to sleep on sleep. OK, so multiple studies have linked not getting enough sleep 
to weight gain. So we know that sleep is an important modulator of neuroendocrine function, the way we metabolize glucose and our appetite regulation. So how much sleep do you need? Well, the CDC recommendation of, for adults is seven to nine hours, right? So you wanna get somewhere in that range. But most of the studies have shown that less than six hours per night, those folks tend to have the highest BMI and um, those who sleep eight or more hours tend to have the lowest BMI. So why does this happen? So um, one of the things that happens when we don't get enough sleep, we talked about cortisol earlier, the stress hormone, when we don't have enough sleep, we are looking at an increase in cortisol the next day. And we know that cortisol is associated with increased appetite and weight gain. Another thing that happens with insufficient sleep is that the next day we are secreting more insulin after each meal. You may have heard of insulin resistance and you may have heard about the role that insulin can have in weight gain. One of the things insulin does is it promotes fat storage. So when we're not sleeping enough, we secrete more insulin after we're eating meals the next day. We also see lower levels of the hormone leptin the next day after a night of insufficient sleep. Um, and leptin is our satiety hormone. So leptin is what tells our brains essentially that we are full. And then the other hormone that we see modulated is that we see higher levels of ghrelin with insufficient sleep. And this is your hunger hormone. So this is the hormone that is telling you that you are hungry. So what does this all mean when we put it together? What this means is if you're not getting enough sleep, you are going to have food cravings, um, even when you've had enough calories, right? So your fullness, you're going to be hungrier and your fullness cues are not working quite well. And so you're going to be eating more. You're also more likely to eat foods with sugar and simple carbohydrates that satisfy a craving for quick energy because that's one of the changes that's going to be happening. And that's something that cortisol does as well. Um, you're not binging on kale, right? So let's be realistic that next day after a night of poor sleep, you may have noticed the foods that you're reaching for are not typically the ones that are gonna be most consistent with your health goals, including weight management. Also, you're tired, right? So you're less likely to exercise and movement declines the next day when you've had a poor night of sleep. Of course, I always hate fear mong mongering. So if some nights like this are normal, we're just not gonna sleep perfectly all the time. It's more at looking about, you know, looking at what your sleep looks like over the long term, and if you may need to clean up your sleep overall, right? That's something to really pay attention to. My fourth tip is to manage your stress, okay? So this is easier said than done, but there are many pathways that we know connect stress with obesity and difficulty with weight management. One of them is through the cognitive functioning, right? So stress can undermine our ability to make decisions, to self-regulate. You may have heard that it makes it more difficult with something called executive functioning. So stress does make our, kind of undermines our cognitive abilities and makes it more difficult to stick to our plan, right? When we are stressed out, especially chronically. Um, it also can lead to changes in the way that our brain processes rewards. And so we're more likely to seek foods that are high reward. So these are things like high sugar, added sugar foods, um, you know, high carbohydrates, simple carbohydrate foods, um, a lot of salts, a lot of fats that may not be the healthiest, that type of thing. Um, there's also some physiological changes that occur with stress, again, cortisol, right? You're hearing a theme. So of course, when we're chronically stressed, we're secreting more cortisol, and that is associated with fat deposits in the abdomen, increased appetite and weight gain. And when we're stressed, we tend to not sleep as well. And we just talked about that. We also tend to cut back on physical activity. So what can we do about this? Experiment with ways to cope with difficult feelings. If you notice, you know, stress management is its own talk or series of talk. But if you're noticed stress getting the best of you, what can you do? What are the, your go-tos? Um, you know, what are some relaxation strategies that work for you? Some breathing techniques. But I always tell people to target these three things when they're stressed first, which is your physical activity, even if you don't feel like it, your sleep. How can we prioritize it? Stop scared, staring at the screen. Maybe read a nice book before bed and sunlight, right? So these are all things that we know can impact stress and are very tangible, right, in a positive way. So those are three things to start with. My uh, fifth tip is to eat mindfully. So we know from research that food intake tends to be higher when people aren't paying attention. 
and they're distracted. So you can see um, my graphic on the right, the upper right hand side over there. Uh, this often unfortunately looks like me <laughs> when I am eating my lunch at my desk or on my computer or talking on the phone. But I do try very hard to have at least one or two meals a day where I am only eating and I am not doing anything else whatsoever. Um, it's really challenging, especially when you first start practicing. But I do notice for sure, even at a personal level, that I eat less and I am more satisfied with smaller quantities when I am paying attention to what I'm eating. So why does mindful eating work in the studies as well? So we know that it sharpens our ability to recognize our internal cues of when I'm actually hungry and when I'm actually full, right? Um, we know from research that those who eat more mindfully with less distractions, they tend to weigh less. They tend to have fewer weight fluctuations. So how can we put this into place? The first thing you can do is to sit down to eat from a plate, right? Just sit down, don't do anything else, don't have any screens on, right? Turn off all of the screens and just focus on what you're eating. Another tip is just to eat really slowly. I have a toddler and just by survival, I have noticed that I've been eating quite fast lately. So I've tried really hard to start to counteract that and eat slower. Some of the ways I do that is just to take a breath each time I eat and to put my fork or spoon down. Just put the utensil down, take a long exhale. That's great for stress management also. Focus on all your senses. Really notice all the spices, the flavors in the food. What do you smell? What do you see, right? So eating with your eyes as well. My sixth tip is to reduce added sugars. So diets that are high in added sugars and refined carbohydrates we know are linked to obesity. There are some different suggestions out there, you know, from different health organizations, um, the American Heart Association, which is the one I most frequently look at just due to working in cardiac rehab, suggests a, a pretty strict added sugar limit of no more than 100 calories per day for women, which is about 24 grams, or no more than 150 calories per day or about 36 grams of added sugar for most men. This can vary based on individual factors, if you're diabetic and this and that, right? So you want to consult with a nutritionist or doctor. But the added sugars are very easy to find. I have that in the graphic here. Um, they actually added to this nutrition label some years back. Um, they had to, due to government regulations, add this line about how many added grams of sugars are included. And that's really the part that you want to look at because there can be natural sugars, like in milk, right? There's sugars in there from lactulose, but that's a naturally occurring sugar, which is a little different or a lot different for your body, right? Um, same with fruits, right? So fruits have sugars, but there's fiber. Those sugars are naturally occurring and they're bound, bound into fiber. So added sugars are added either before, during, or after the cooking process. So why are added sugars not great for us in terms of weight management and our metabolic health? Well, the reason is because it causes us to, you know, secrete excess glucose into the bloodstream. When we secrete excess glucose, Insulin is the responding hormone, and we already talked about earlier how insulin promotes fat storage in our adipose tissue, and this can lead to weight gain over time. So make sure to check your labels. Some hidden added sugars that I've seen um, that are very common that you may not realize, ketchup, right? Ketchup and barbecue sauce. I, the last one I looked at, the barbecue sauce had 18 grams of added sugars in it just for one serving, right? And that was just a couple tablespoons. Cereal, of course, can just be, have tons of sugar. I, I, me and my uh, husband joke that it can be like a real sugar bomb, right? Even though we really like cereal, we've got to look at that cinnamon toast crunch and also look at the serving size. Granola bars can have a lot. Um, I recently looked at a Cliff Bar. It had 18 grams of sugar in the one that I had in the store. Yogurt, similar. Um, sometimes you're looking at like 18 plus um, added sugar grams. So really take a look at that. Simply cutting more of those out, not saying never have added sugar. Of course, we have to have food sometimes we enjoy um, just for fun, right? But just again, day in, day out, really trying to reduce that would be a great idea for weight loss. My seventh tip, don't exercise to lose weight. This one is probably going to surprise a lot of people. Um, and I will clarify but the kind of exercise that many of us do, which would be, let's say, on a great week, 150 minutes of walking, um, let's say moderate activity like walking, is going to be ineffective for weight loss by itself. So 
if we're like a 150 pound person, if they walk for three miles, right, at a kind of moderate pace, they may burn maybe 150 or so calories. That's one soda, right? So you can see how that doesn't, that equation of calories in, calories out doesn't work very well um, when we are trying to outrun a bad diet, as they say. And we know from the literature that even adding moderate exercise to a diet change doesn't lead to drastic weight loss changes either. So there's been some pretty good studies that compare people who are on some type of weight loss program for their dietary changes, and they compare that to those who also add moderate exercise to that diet. And the difference is only about like three or four pounds. Now that can be a significant difference for some people, but it's nothing drastic. Um, with more intense exercise, like HIIT training, CrossFit, things like that, one problem that can happen is that our bodies often compensate by boosting appetite, and our bodies like to get to a state of homeostasis. And so they're pretty good at like reducing our metabolism again, right? And so that's something your body tends to want to re-regulate when we over-exercise or do something really intense. Um, exercise also can be, people often use it as either like a punishment or a reward. So like, oh, I exercise for 30 minutes today, so therefore I get to eat all of these things, right? And so they tend to overeat by quite a bit for what they exercise or they feel bad about they, what they ate and try to over-exercise the next day. And that cause, can cause inflammation and injuries and things like that. But some things to note, of course, there's a zillion reasons to exercise beyond just that's a great way to lose weight because it's, as we know, it's really not a great weight loss strategy, but it can help people we've seen in studies to maintain weight loss and prevent weight gain. So when you look at studies of people who have successfully lost 30 or more pounds and kept it off over the course of years, often decades, those people often walk a lot. They move a lot. So it really does help people to maintain its seams and prevent weight gain. Um, and of course, there's just so many reasons that exercise is good for us cardiac, you know, from a cardiac metabolic perspective as well. So definitely exercise. It's just on its own, not going to uh, do much to help you lose weight. And it's not a great weight loss strategy in and of itself. So I always tell people to choose joyful movement, move your body. It's one of the best things you can do for yourself from a health and mental health perspective, but choose something that you actually like, whether it's walking, swimming, um, whether it's a yoga class, just move your body and do it in a way that's not punishing, something that you enjoy. My eighth tip is to try out stimulus control strategies. So there have been some studies um, and some pretty good studies that show that the food that we keep at home or that's in our immediate environment can affect our weight and our eating behaviors, right? So one thing to do is to change your environment to promote the most healthy choices um, that you can at home, right? So let's say, um, for example, one idea is that you can toss or give away foods that really won't support your weight or health management goals. So for example, for me, Something I really enjoy a lot is chips, salsa, uh, chips, and queso. I absolutely still have those foods in my life because I believe that all foods can fit into your health program and your weight loss program. However, I often will not keep things like that in my home because if I really want it, I can just go out and get it, right? And I know from this research that if I keep it at home, I'm more likely to have those foods more frequently and that won't support my goals. The foods that are closest to you, like on the kitchen counter, for example, you're more likely to eat. So for example, you might wanna put some fresh fruit out on your counter or at the very front of your fridge, put some cut up vegetables. Like go ahead and cut them up with your meal prep and have them in the front of the refrigerator so you see them first. I also tell people to create friction, it's called, on less healthy choices in the home. So even if let's say potato chips are tough for you, but your you know, spouse likes to have potato chips in the home or your kids like to have them in the home, you can always make it more challenging or not as readily visible to you by just having them up high, right? I have to use a step stool to get to certain foods in our pantry. That's an extra step for me. I have to really think about it and I have to really want it. I can have those things, but it's definitely the foods that are the healthiest for me and fit with my program are right in front of my face. So just um, thinking about the way that you set up your environment. Another tip is to embrace the long game. So most diets, and truly this graph will show you, most diets can deliver weight loss over some period of time. 
And that period of time is often short term. So when you look at the papers about specific diets, whether it be intermittent fasting or the ketogenic diet or a low fat diet or other low carb diets, right? You, you name the diet. You can demonstrate weight loss in these studies, but they're usually only done for a certain period of time. And we know that most diets do tend to fail in the long term. So what I'll tell y'all, and this is actually from a very good um, and excellent paper, I would say, that came out in 2021. And that's where this graph is from, and it was for Optimal Diet Strategies for Weight Loss. This is a really good graph um, from that paper that effectively compares a whole bunch of diets based on randomized evidence for their role in weight loss. And the paper concluded a couple of things. Um, the first thing that it concluded is that there is no single best diet for weight loss. And the other thing that it concluded is that reducing calorie intake is the most important factor for weight loss for any diet. So kind of combining what we saw from this and other papers, as well as um, from what I've learned, you know, over the years in my field, the best diet for weight loss has kind of three components. The first is that it's nutritionally, nutritionally sound. So any diet that's going to be cutting out major nutrients, like entire food groups, I'm not a fan of, right? Because you may not be getting all of the nutrients that you need. The other thing that the diet needs have is a calorie deficit. And that's typically going to be somewhere between 500 and 1,000 calorie deficit, depending on you and your individual needs. And the third thing, and to me, the most important thing and what most diets miss is that it needs to be sustainable in the long term. So the question that you want to ask yourself when considering any dietary change is, could I be eating this way five years from now? And if the answer is no, this is probably not the best diet, quote unquote, for your weight management or really your health in general, because we know that most people regain the weight after going on a restrictive diet. So the best approach is to consider these three principles and to make slow incremental changes over time. This is not an answer that anyone likes, but this is actually what we know works. Okay, I'm having a, a slides advancing issue here. Okay, there we go. Um, okay, so another tip is to get social support. So we're running out of time, so I'm just going to breeze through this one, but I think it kind of speaks for itself. The research has demonstrated that individuals who have more support as they're trying to lose weight or reach their health goals tend to be more successful. But this could be really anyone. Um, this could be a friend, a spouse. You want to choose someone that's supportive. We all need kind of emotional support in the sense of a shoulder to lean on when we're feeling discouraged or like it's really challenging for us one day. Um, we also need practical support. So for me, someone to watch my toddler while I meal prep or cut up vegetables or that type of thing. And we also really benefit from inspiring support as well. So someone who really encourages us um, to stick with our health goals, even when it really feels like you want to give up. And this is my final tip, which is to avoid, this goes along with what I mentioned earlier about being in it for the long haul. This tip is to avoid an on the diet, off the diet mentality, right? In other words, this all or none thinking. And I think the cartoon that I have there really explains it all, right? So um, I already messed up. I ate too much this weekend. You know, I'm just going to keep eating this way and I'm just going to eat what I want. Um, and is probably foods that don't even make you feel good. And then come Monday, I'll start again, right? Or I'll start again next month or next year, right? January 1st, the most popular day to start a diet. But the truth is that this is what keeps us caught in cycles, right? Of weight cycling, we call it of losing weight and then regaining it over and over again. So if you want to make changes and modify your health and your weight in ways that are going to be sustainable, we want to avoid this thinking trap, this all or nothing. We want to remove extreme vocabulary when we're talking about our diet and the changes that we're trying to make. So it's not, I can never have this. I have to get rid of all added sugars, right? That's usually going to lead to the opposite of what we want over time, right? That we are going to binge on these foods or think about them a lot. And ultimately, we're going to regain weight if we lose it. 
So what can we try instead? I'm a really big fan, and I know a lot of nutritionists are as well, of the 85-15 rule. Sometimes people say the 90-10 rule. I kind of like 85-15. It gives me a little more room for error, um, but you'll have to find the number that works for you. But this rule is like 85% of the time you're trying to stick with the plan, right? The, the changes that are going to be best for your weight management goals and your health. And 15% of the time, you are a human, right? Um, and you're not going to be perfect. And it's never about being perfect. I also encourage people to rebrand the cheat meal, right? I'm a psychologist. These are terms I hear about a lot. And I know that they can cause a lot of guilt in people. So let's get rid of the terms cheat meal or cheat day or cheat foods, right? Those terms obviously are insinuating that you're doing something bad. And we know that guilt is absolutely not helpful for weight loss. In fact, um, when we tend to have more of a restrictive and self-critical mindset, people tend to gain more weight, right? So I encourage you to maybe think of it instead as a plan exception and really plan for it, right? So I'm going on a trip to California with my husband this week, and I'm looking forward to some plan exceptions. I'm looking forward to some enjoyable foods, um, enjoying some restaurants out in California. So these are plan exceptions for me, and I'm fully expecting that I will enjoy myself and plan for those. And I always say all foods fit, right? So this can really help us to avoid the on off mentality, whether it's demonizing carbs or whatever, fat, right? Whatever it is that week, because um, I know there's a lot in the media that can be confusing, but just know that all foods can fit and try to think about it as this 85, 15 or 90, 10, whatever works for you. So that was my final tip, but I had to include a slide about semaglutide injections, right? We go the azimphic because I know that I'm going to get questions about this. I am not a physician, right? And so I do want to throw that out there, but I do work in this space of weight management and I do work um, with individuals who are on these injections. And of course I have looked at the literature about them because the first thing that I want to do is to be informed. So what I'll tell you, I can't tell you whether or not you should try these things. And these are based on a lot of individual factors that you should talk about with your doctor if you're interested. One thing I've seen in the literature is that, of course, the impacts of these drugs on weight are substantial, right? So the largest trial that we have um, was from Wegovy, and it demonstrated that um, the participants over the course of 68 weeks lost about 15% of their body weight, which we know is very meaningful amount of body weight clinically, or about, at least for these participants, it was about 33.7 pounds on average. And this was a very, you know, top of the line, randomized control, double blind, placebo controlled study. So it's a very good study. Um, they saw that most of the common, ad, you know, most common adverse side effects were GI related. So the majority of participants had at least mild nausea. But we also know that there's some other adverse side effects, like a higher risk of pancreatitis than the control group, um, as well as some gallstones and things like that. So that's something to consider. There's also some concern potentially for thyroid cancer, especially if you have that family history. Um, but one of the things I will point out is once the injections, there was another study that came out last year in 2022 and that kind of after the trial, what happened to these people? And what they found is that once the injections were removed, which was week 68, most of the weight was regained in these participants and it happened really quickly for the most part. Um, so that's discouraging, but I guess the million dollar question is, do people need to take these drugs forever if they start them? And I think from what I'm seeing so far, and we only have two years, right? That's the best that we have so far is two years of data about these drugs. The data that we have suggests, yes, that these are going to be indefinite, um, you know, injections for people who want to maintain that the weight that they lose on these drugs. And we don't have any data after two years of follow-up. So we don't have the data to answer many of the questions a lot of us, including myself, may have about possible rare side effects. Are there any implications health-wise of long-term use if it looks like I've got to stay on these things to maintain the losses? So um, that's the best answer that I can give you. Again, that's just with the data that we have. Um, so whether or not you yourself should try these medications, is up to you and your doctor. And just a few additional resources. So I mentioned some self-monitoring earlier as being the hallmark of behavioral 
um, therapy, for weight management, some of the apps that are free and that I have personally vetted and have recommended to some of our cardiac rehab patients, although I'm not, you know, I'm open to learn more about others, but um, this is the MyFitnessPal app is great because it is free. You can get a subscription and get access to like premium things if you want, but you can just download this and start using it right away for free. And um, some of the things it'll do is like track your calories. It'll track like your calorie breakdown between your macronutrients like carbohydrates, fat and protein. It'll track your weight for you and your activity. A lot of like the smart watches will um, just automatically, I know like a Fitbit or something will just automatically um, log the exercise into this app if you have them syncing. The Fujikate app I really like. This is something that will give foods a grade based on their like nutritional content. Um, so for example, you might be in the store and scan the barcode of a um, some bread, a loaf of bread, and it might say, hey, this, this is a C minus and here's why. It's got added sugars or this and that, or it's very processed. Um, you might try this bread with a B grade instead, right? And it's just another tool to help you because I, there is so much, it's very complicated with nutrition, right? And it can be another tool to help you make a better decision if that's what you so choose. And then Happy Scale, um, many people who have ups and downs in their weight or have a history of, you know, challenges with their weight, they develop like scale anxiety, right? Um, we don't want to step on the scale or kind of the age old, let me take all these clothes off first before I weigh myself or I'm only going to weigh myself first thing in the morning. And of course, that's there's very normal fluctuations that happen in our weight based on fluid or what we ate in sodium the day before or stool, right? All of that. Um, so the Happy Scale app does, our, it was actually created by some psychologists and it does a great job of smoothing out fluctuations um, and the app just kind of instead of looking like it at weight loss always often does which is a lot of ups and downs day to day it makes it you start to see your progress a little bit better um, because of course one week you might gain a pound but as a whole you're still trending in a downward direction with your weight so I really like that and it also helps you to predict your weight for upcoming events so that being said um, I am finished with the slides portion and happy to answer as many questions as I have until our time ends for today. Awesome. Great information. We have a, a tremendous number of questions that have already come in. Um, so I'm sure, relatively sure that I'm going to be sending you a bunch okay. of uh, questions that you can respond and keep in mind, Megan is going on vacation and I'm not going to ask her to answer the questions while she's on vacation. Um, so, with that in mind, we will probably upload those sometime next week, just to give you time. It's an anniversary week, so we're excited for you. So yeah. if a patient has normal levels, normal to low blood pressure, would you recommend exploring a thyroid issue? If a person has normal levels. Normal, normal or normal to low blood pressure. Normal to low blood pressure. Well, um, so I'm not a physician, so I'm not sure exactly what the guidelines are, but I know that like thyroid screening is really common. I don't want to answer that, but I think that's a better physician question. But I think it's one of those levels that is often, I know mine was recently checked because um, I delivered a child last year. So I think you'll just have to talk to your doctor about whether or not thyroid screening is recommended for you. What's Delaware doing that the rest of the country is not to have such a low rate of self-reported obesity? Uh, sorry, what did you say? Delaware has such a low self-reported obesity. Oh, what are they doing differently? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I think that's actually a really interesting question. I don't know specifically what Delaware is doing differently. Um, but I do know that, like, just across the country, so you may have noticed that certain states um, have, like, different levels um and some of them didn't even have enough data to really be on the map so depending on which map it was so sometimes it's just insufficient data but for some of those states that were more in the yellow color and have lower rates of obesity there's a lot of people trying to figure that out right what are they doing right um so california is one of those states as well that tends to have lower rates so is it something about you know that people tend to be more active overall? Do they have better access to fresh produce? We know there's these things like food deserts in the United States where people just mm -hmm. don't have access to much fresh food and they're, they're having to deal with a lot more processed food. So um, I'm not exactly sure, but it's complicated is the answer. 
How often should you weigh yourself when you're a self monitoring? Yeah, so there's been studies um, about this specific topic and I get asked this a lot. And what I usually end up doing when I'm working with patients is asking them a series of questions to try to help them discover what the best amount is for them. So the studies, like on the one hand, there's some that say every day is good. On the other hand, there's some that say once a week is good. If you are a person who tends to, like we talked about earlier with calorie tracking, go a little overboard and quote unquote obsess, you may not be a person who should be weighing themselves daily, right? Those fluctuations that just happen because of sodium or fluid or the medications we're on or stool content may be very upsetting and anxiety provoking for you. So it might be better for you to weigh yourself once a week or once a month if you are in that category. However, if you're the type of person that can see that data every day and just see it as data, like, oh, so just information, right? And not become upset or anxious about it, it might be better to weigh yourself daily, right? So you kind of have to meet yourself where you are. Surely, Fujicate and Happy Scale apps appear to be free, at least in the Apple um, yeah. downloads. So just be aware of that. That was one of the questions that came in. Oh, yeah, only have time for. Free. Yeah, only a couple more questions uh, based off of time. So how do you overcome feeling bad when you food log? Yeah, so, you know, some people, this is so entrenched in diet culture, right? In toxic diet culture, might I add, that we should feel bad when we go off plan or eat something, quote unquote, bad, right? Um, that it's so entrenched that it can be really hard to pay attention to that, catch it, and flip the narrative, right? And the script. Of course, it does start with you, right? And so some people even require and benefit from working with a therapist on this. So I highly recommend it if that's so entrenched that it's something that you think you could get some coaching or help with, definitely get that support. But a good first step is just being aware when you log something that you're having that feeling. Oh, I'm logging that I had five Oreos. I, I keep thinking on Oreos, but it's just a good example. Like I feel bad, right? I shouldn't have done that, right? Okay, red flag right away, right? Actually, this is just data. I'm just observing myself and my behaviors. And yeah, I went off plan and tomorrow I'm going to try something different, right? And I'm not a bad person for going off plan. We've got to separate the food we eat from who we are as people and our values. Final question, and then we'll let you go. And I think we kind of addressed it, but what do we consider a proper amount of sleep? It, it does vary from person to person. Uh, but is there kind of a sweet spot? They say, you know, certain uh, hour range, but what's the sweet spot? The sweet spot is going to be between seven to nine hours of sleep a night. That is what the CDC has recommended. And that's based on a lot of research. Um, I will say some people are more on the seven hours of that range. They wake up after seven hours. They feel completely refreshed. They are able to function quite well. They feel good about that amount of sleep and they wake up naturally after seven hours. Some people are more at that nine end. So you want to really pay attention to what's the best for you by like how refreshed you feel in the morning and how fatigued you feel during the day and that type of thing. Awesome. Again, fantastic information. Dr. Hayes, thank you so much for coming back and joining us on yet another webinar. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. You are so welcome and enjoy your anniversary trip. And a quick reminder to our guests, a uh, replay of today's webinar will be uploaded on our website. By tomorrow, live attendees will receive an email once the link is ready. In a moment, I'm gonna highlight a few upcoming webinars, but first we'd love for you to join us for our 15th annual Uncork Education on November 2nd. Test your skill at Plinko and Collapse of Bounce. Enjoy wine and beer tasting, indulge in old fashioned in Old Fashions and Manhattans and bid on live and silent auction items. Registration for our in-person event is $60. Just want to bid? It's free, but you still need to register. Register at alumni.uab.edu slash uncork2023. And as promised, here are some upcoming webinars to consider. On Thursday, October 26, join verified content creator Joshua Darren for Haunts and History, the reality of urban legends as we explore the paranormal and folklore in Alabama and the South. On Thursday, November 9th, Dr. Benjamin Meadows will be here for An Economist Goes Shopping, Black Fridays, Holidays, and the Current Economic Climate. Dr. Meadows will share what the current economy is like and what we can expect heading into the new year. On Thursday, December 7th, we'll be exploring National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation during We're Gonna Have the Hap Hap Happiest Christmas. 
Gareth Jones will share why this movie has become a cult classic. And come back for in the new year on January 18th for Eating Well on a Budget, Wallet-Friendly Strategies for Nutritious Meals. Emily Davidson will join us to share tips on how to meal plan and get the best bang for your buck. Register for these and many more at alumni.uab.edu slash events. Finally, let us know how we're doing and what you'd like to see. The QR code on your screen takes you to a very short survey. Share your thoughts with us as we continue to offer virtual presentations like today's. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And as always, go Blazers.